March 18, 2018, Stefan Clark is shot and killed by the Sacramento Police Department. Word quickly spreads the police shot an unarmed black man in the back who was just hanging out in his grandparents' backyard. March 22, 2018, activist groups shut down the I-5 in Sacramento and prevent fans from entering the Sacramento Kings game. Multiple protests break out all over the country. March 2, 2019, almost one year later, the Sacramento District Attorney releases a 61-page report stating that the two officers involved in the shooting acted lawfully in the shooting death of Clark. Guess what we're going to be talking about today, ladies and gentlemen? That's right, that 61-page report that I just mentioned. Of course, we're not going to talk about all 61 pages of the DA's report or listen to the hour and 18 minutes of her talking. I'm just going to go over some of the key points in the report. If you think I'm lying, if you think I'm wrong, please, by all means, go read the report. I read the entire thing today. I have to say it is the most thorough report on a shooting incident I have ever seen. This DA's office really wanted to be right about their decision and not bringing charges against the officers. A lot of people are looking at this and saying, well, obviously the DA's office is a racist. Obviously all the criminal pathologists who made the autopsy are racist. Obviously the toxicologist is racist. And obviously the two officers are just racist without even peeking at the report. Before we start, I just want to say an unarmed black man was shot in the back in this situation. And I understand that that's all some people need to hear before they form a serious opinion on the matter. Even if people read the 61-page report and still think the officers should be charged, I'm happy because at least they took the time of the day to try and figure out what happened. The report is great. It has some amazing details in it. Details that a lot of major news outlets aren't really focusing on. It starts off with the information they use for the decision, including 911 records, police reports from the local and state level, dispatch logs, body cam, helicopter cam, crime scene video, photos, diagrams, forensic evidence, toxicology reports, autopsy reports, phone records, outside expert reports, and more. They researched this one shooting, this few minute span of him running from police, him being shot for nearly a year. Every expert and their brother came out to talk about this in this report. We'll start under the big bold letters, factual summary, meaning without a doubt, these things happen. At 9 p.m., a man witnessed Stefan Clark break the window out of a gold Camry and sat down in the car. Clark then broke the window of a dark SUV, and then he broke the window of a white Explorer. The owner of the white SUV walked outside. Clark simply stared at him, and he called for his wife to get his gun, stating that he said it loudly enough in hopes to chase Clark off, but he just continued to sit there and stare at him. The man then grabbed a baseball bat and confronted Clark, who ran into an adjacent yard. That's when the man with the baseball bat called 911 about the car break-in. Two S- PD officers were dispatched to the scene and the sheriff's helicopter said they'd be happy to assist. Officers arrived on scene and the guy who called the police told the cops, yeah, he's in that yard over there. Can we check your backyard real quick? Supposedly somebody just broke some windows over here and then ran through your yard. Shortly after the helicopter spotted Clark standing on the back door of a home, Clark took a cinder block and broke the glass on the back door. It just broke the window running south, running to the south. The home was occupied by an 89-year-old man at the time. Clark then ran off while the helicopter radioed his location to officers. One of the officers saw Clark and started issuing commands to show his hands and to stop. Hey! Show me your hands! Stop! Stop! Five, seven, seven. Clark ran from the officers into his grandparents' backyard. At the time, officers had no idea this was his grandparents' backyard. This was a big thing when this story first broke. It was an unarmed black man shot in the back while just hanging out in his grandparents' backyard. They didn't know this. No one knew this at the time except for Clark. Officer 1 came around the corner into the backyard and later stated that he saw Clark with his hands extended out in front of him at chest level consistent with a shooting position. He stated that he saw a metallic reflection or flash of something coming at him from Clark's position and he thought it was a muzzle flash. He yelled, show me your hands, gun, and return to cover. In response to the officer's lawful order right there, Clark yells, fuck you. Officer 2 rounded the corner at about the same time and later stated that he saw Clark in an isosceles position with his hands punched out in front of him holding an object. So both of the officers rounded the corner, and yes, it ultimately ended up being a cell phone, but they saw this in the dark from about 20 feet away. Officer 2 also stated that he saw a flash of light, thought that it was the light reflecting off of a metallic object, and feared that it was a firearm based off of the way that Clark was holding it. Officer 1 poked his head out from around the corner and saw Clark advancing on them 
in the same shooter stance position. Officer 2 stated that he thought Clark had the drop on them, so he opened fire to protect himself and his partner. Officer 1 saw a bright metallic flash of light in Clark's hands and also opened fire because he thought Clark was shooting at them. Both officers later stated they thought they had fired five shots apiece. Two other officers arrived on scene and they all discussed how to get the gun away from Clark. Five minutes after the first shots were fired, they approached Clark, cleared the scene, and started giving CPR. Turns out, as we all know, there wasn't a gun. It was a cell phone. So that's factually what happened. Now, what made it a lawful shooting? What made it possible for the DA to not charge the officers with a crime? The district attorney completely Barney-styled this report, so it's really hard not to understand it. She starts off explaining what her job is as the DA, to find if there's sufficient evidence to charge any involved officer with a crime. Something that's abundantly clear in this report is that the DA relied heavily on Clark's state of mind leading up to the shooting, probably because he walked towards two officers in a clear shooting stance. Why would anyone do that? 48 hours before the shooting, the mother of his children, Selena, got the police out to her place and told them he had hit her several times in the face, choked her, and threw her head against a wall. Officers concluded that there was probable cause to arrest him for this incident based on her injuries, the evidence at hand, and the fact that he was on probation for two domestic violence incidents against the mother, the same woman. He was also on probation for felony robbery, but he was not on the scene at the time for them to arrest him. He was out with some friends. In a 12-hour period following the domestic violence incident, Clark attempted to call Selena 76 times. They exchanged many text messages during this time. She keeps saying, you're going to jail. You're never going to see your kids again. He keeps saying, what are you talking about? I wasn't even there. Why are you doing this to me? Why are you ruining my life? At one point, she says, you scared for your life now that you'll be locked in a cage the rest of your life and never see your kids grow up. You effed up. I'm done saving you. There are dozens of text messages back and forth between them arguing. At around 9 p.m. the night before the shooting, he starts Googling how to kill himself. What pills would kill him? How much bleach would you have to drink to kill yourself? How much carbon monoxide can kill you? What pills mixed with alcohol would kill you? He he does dozens of searches on suicide and how to carry it out. In between his searches, he's hitting up various people trying to buy Xanax. At around 10 p.m. the night before the shooting, he texts a picture of a handful of pills and says, let's fix our family or I'm taking all these. Selena replies would do it. I don't give a fuck. Yes, this is the same woman who's the fiance who's on the news crying about this. Toxicology reports at the time of his death said he had alcohol, Xanax, codeine, weed, hydrocodone, and cocaine in his system. The reason we're discussing this, if you couldn't already guess, it's leading up to a suicide by cop theory. So let's get back to the shooting. I said earlier that the officers felt like they had shot five times apiece. They had actually shot 10 times apiece. One officer fired five rounds in 1.4 seconds, delayed for 0.8 seconds, then fired five more rounds in 1.5 seconds. The other officer fired 10 consecutive shots in 2.1 seconds. Adrenaline dumps and stressful situations like this do crazy stuff to a body and mind. They thought they had shot half of what they actually shot. The report states that Clark moved from a standing to a prone position in approximately approximately 1.8 seconds while the shots were being fired. How a body falls to a prone position is unpredictable and can include turning, twisting, and bending at the waist. Clark's final resting place shows that he twisted onto his right side as officers continued to fire. He was shot a total of seven times. Once in the thigh from the front, three times in his right side, and three more times on the right side of the back. This is just me saying this. This isn't in the report, but it looks like the leg shot may have taken him down. He fell to his right side, as confirmed by the report, and the remaining shots hit him in the target provided by the officers as he was laying on his right side. Five pathologists, five doctors signed off on this. The doctor hired by the Clark family legal team tried to say that he was primarily shot in the back. That doctor also stated that Clark was shot eight times. This is false. The five pathologists who signed off on the original autopsy disputed almost every bit of what the hired pathologist had to say. The hired pathologist tried to say that he was mostly shot in his back, which was untrue, and the five other pathologists with 50 years combined experience said no, that's not what happened. In the end, several experts from several different fields of law concluded that the officers had reason to believe they were facing a deadly force situation. This was based on the shooting stance, the flash of light, advancing on the officers while still in the shooting stance, and a very, very important factor here was the spontaneous statements made by officers like gun, confirming they had not been hit. You all right, you hit? Yeah, I'm good. Right. And discussing how they should safely retrieve the firearm. Don't, I don't see it. He hasn't moved at all. He hasn't moved at all.
The report ends with officers are entitled to the same protections of the law as every other citizen. The law of self-defense is well established and clear. Deadly force may be used when an officer or citizen honestly and reasonably believes that they are in imminent danger of death or great bodily harm. In this case, the officer's conduct and statements in the time frame immediately before and after the shooting show that both officers honestly and reasonably believed Stefan Clark was pointing a gun at them and was about to shoot or had already shot at them. One big thing that I've seen online that I want to address real quick is people asking why the officers muted their mics after the whole thing was done and over with. After everything was done and over with, the officers walked to the front of the house and they muted their mics. Well, obviously, they must be covering something up, right? They're just trying to get their stories straight. I just want to ask people saying that, how how so? What could they possibly cover up? It's all on video directly in front of us. It's easy to pick apart a situation like this over the course of a year, and especially since all the information is released, we could sit here all day and pick it apart. Those officers, on the other hand, had a split second to make their decision, and they both honestly thought this guy was about to open fire on them. I'm not saying, hey, Stefan Clark deserved that. It's a tragic situation. I mean, he had children who are now going to grow up without a father. I'm just explaining in this video why the decision was made by the DA to not charge the police officers. So how's the media handling this? By making false statements and inciting riots, of course. This is a clip of NBC Nightly News talking about the Stephon Clark shooting after the district attorney announced her decision to not file charges on the officers. Developments tonight in the fatal, sh fatal shooting of an unarmed black man in a California last year. Prosecutors announced that two Sacramento police officers will not face charges saying they did not break any laws when they shot Stefan Clark in his grandparents' backyard. Clark was running away from police when they shot him, saying they thought he was pointing a gun at them. The killing, you may remember, sparked nationwide protests. It's all good. They retracted that part where they said he was shot in the back while fleeing eight hours later. I wonder if all the people who saw the original report saw the retraction. Or did they even care at that point? If you would like to see the full 61 page report by the district attorney, I will be linking that in the comments below. My suggestion to people who live in that area, just stay inside for the next few days. Check this out. YouTube confirmed today that they will not put ads on any shooting or recent sensitive subject. Hey, we're only discussing facts. We're not showing graphic images. We're not showing gore. We're just discussing the facts. Talk to me about that. So this is something that really bothers an awful lot of creators. Uh, they put an awful lot of time and energy into creating really, really good content. But some of the time they're going to touch on issues, like we said, like a controversial issue or a sensitive event that we just can't allow to run ads. That's because advertisers mm -hmm. are sensitive, as I said. Which means any video like this or any recap that has something like this in it. I don't know, so like three quarters of my content. So if you would like to help support the channel, you can do so at patreon.com slash donut operator. Get some super sweet merch from donutoperator.com or just come hang out with me at twitch.tv slash donut operator. Everyone, please have a fantastic day.